we've, we've been walking through the book of Hebrews, and for the next uh, few weeks, uh, we'll be taking a break from that. And, and really, the next two weeks, um, we're going to be exploring um, really what's one of the uh, core um, uh, foundations or values um, of our church. Uh, really, um, it, it's part of our DNA. Um, and if you've been with us for any extended period of time, uh, you've heard us um, proclaim that, that we exist or we desire to be a missional church, um, right? And, and, and every Sunday uh, from the stage, uh, we encourage you to live your life on mission. Um, and and uh, we encourage you to join missional community groups. Um, and so obviously the question um, is, um, what does this mean? Um, what does it mean to be missional? What does it mean to live your life on a mission? What does it look like? Um, and, and, of course, the question is, uh, why be missional? Um, and so if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up um, to the book of Genesis. Um, that's where we're going to be spending uh, a bulk of our time. Um, the word missional is really relatively new um, in, in, in Christian speak, in Christian terminology. It's been around for about um, um, a quarter of a century or so. And, and, and uh, really, they, they, they just coined this phrase to express how, um, how Christians were supposed to uh, live. Um, and so, uh, but, but it's, it's an adjective uh, that means to live with, uh, in a certain way or with, with a mission in mind. Um, and so if you, if you break the word down, you see the word mission uh, in there. Uh, it, it's, it's where um, we jump from, um, which we just added all. Oh, we made it to an adjective, and it describes how we are to live, um, in, in what manner, in, in, in what respect we are to uh, live or to do things. Um, and, and usually when we hear the word mission, right, um, we, we think of overseas missions or, or we think of the Great Commission, and, and we tend to think that it's um, a, a New Testament concept, uh, right, that, that it's something um, post-Jesus, um, and so now we are meant to live on mission. Um, and, and what I'd like to do uh, this morning is really show uh, the note. It actually goes, goes way back um, uh, to, to the beginning. And when I'm talking about the beginning, I'm talking about the beginning beginning, um, way back to Genesis. Uh, if you're a Christian this morning, uh, you don't get much more beginning than Genesis, uh, and, and Genesis chapter 1 even. Um, and so uh, if, if you've got uh, your Bible, turn, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, um, and we're going to start with verse uh, 26. And then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing um, that moves on the earth. Now, if you've grown up in church for, for any, uh, any period of time, or if you've if you spent um, any time uh, around the church or with Christians, you know, uh, you, you've, you've, per you've heard about this truth, um, that we're created in the image of God, um, right? It, it's, it's one of the uh, uh, foundational arguments for maintaining the dignity of life, right? It was one of the clarion cries for the, the abolition movement, that, that, that we're all created in the image of God, and so we value life, we value um, a human uh, life, the, the dignity of life, um, regardless of whatever stage it is, um, because we're all created in the image of God. Um, it's what theologians uh, have called the uh, imago Dei, which is just a, a Latin phrase that means the image of God. Um, so we're all of us, all of us in this room, all of us in the world, we're created in the image of God. Um, now, Theologians and scholars have, have debated over the years about what that really means, um, right? Like, 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 what does it mean uh, that we're created in the image of, of, of God? Um, and, and there are a lot of things that, that they've discussed, a lot of things that have been agreed upon, a lot of things that have been disagreed upon, um, a lot of hurt feelings, a lot of uh, tears, and, and a lot of uh, things joined together, um, and, and uh, thousands of years of speculation. And uh, this morning, I'm going to talk about, um, really, there's two uh, ideas about what this means that we are uh, made in the image of God, um, and, uh, and and what it means that we're, we're, we um, have the imago Dei upon us. Um, now, now, let me start off with what it does not mean. Um, what what it does not mean um, is that um, God physically looks like us. 
Um, and, and, and so, um, I actually, this was new to me because growing up my entire life, I never had this taught to me, and I never had it preached to me. Um, and so when I read the scripture and I read God made um, uh, us in his image, I thought, well, I've got two arms, so God must have two arms. Um, I've got two legs, God must have two, two legs. I've got massive curly hair, so God must have hair. I've got eyes, nose, mouth. Um, and, 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 and that's what I thought. Um, and the issue is that, that the scripture tells us that God is not like man. Um, in, in fact, um, we use um, anthropomorphic language. That, that, that's language um, that we use to describe humans, to, to describe God, because that's the only way we can uh, describe him, right? Um, and so we'll say, uh, so, so we'll read scripture, and it's, it say, it'll say things like, the hand of God saves, right? Or, or that God walked, implying that he has legs in, in, in the cool of the day, in the garden. Um, that God's eyes are, are like fire, that, 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 he scopes out, that his ears are attentive to our cries. But then we'll read things like, like, like his wings uh, cover us, right? Or, or, or we'll read things um, like, like, like his horn of salvation. And, and, and then we, we've, we've got this weird idea, well, is, is, is God quite human? Or is, is he uh, some weird um, mix? Is he male or female? Or is he some weird androgynous mix? What's going on? Um, and, and what we've always recognized is that um, that's not what um, the scripture is saying. Um, and so... Um, being made in the image of God is, isn't primarily about us, about us physically looking like God, right? Um, and so one predominant view is that, um, that we share attributes or characteristics with God, um, right? And so, so what that means is um, that, God, that, that we have intellect and we have the ability to reason and think um, and, and form memories and we have the ability to love and forgive. And so because we do that, because we can do that, um, and because God does that, because God has intellect, because God uh, loves and forgives, um, that's what it means to be made in the image of God, um, that, that we share in, in these attributes. Um, uh, because, um, you know, we have uh, intellect, and that, and that might be a stretch for some of us, we have intellect, uh, we have the ability to forgive. And after all, um, uh, our, our, our pets can't do that, right? Our, our pets cannot do that to the ability that we can. And so uh, because of that, that is one of the evidences that they'll say that we're created in the image of God. Um, now, there's incredible truth to this claim um, because it's very true that, that our ability to forgive, our ability to think and form memories um, is, is, is given to us by God, um, is an attribute that we share with God. Um, but we run into a problem because what happens to... Um, those who are born with, uh, with, with, with uh, mental defects or birth defects or um, those who um, do not have the ability uh, to have intellect like we do, uh, like, like we do or d do not have the ability to, to communicate like we do or, or form thoughts um, or um, what happens, like, so, so in, in that sense, are they somehow not quite the image of God? Um, are, are, are they second-rate citizens or second-tier citizens of the kingdom of God? Um, or what happens to, to our grandparents as, as they get older um, and things like dementia sits in, uh, sets in or, or Alzheimer's, and, and they begin to, to, to lose um, a focus of what's reality and what's real or, or, or lose memories? And, and in that moment, are, do they become less like the image of God? Um, and, and as Christians, um, our resounding cry would be no, um, that they're still an image of God. Um, and so, uh, and they're not uh, second-class uh, citizens. Um, and so this leads us to um, the second view, uh, or the second idea or, or, or thesis, um, and that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time on. Um, the second view of what the Imago Dei means, uh, is, is the understanding of this view, is that God has called us into relationship with himself. Um, and, so, and so in that uh, relationship, we're to reflect God to the world, to the created order about what he's like. Um, and that dictates the imagery that we, ref we reflect in our lives. So, so think about a mirror, right? A mirror, no matter what size or what it looks like, whether it be small or large, a vanity mirror, whatever, however you decorate it, a mirror has one functional purpose, um, one primary distinct purpose, and that is to accurately reflect um, whatever it is placed in front of, right? That, that, that is the only reason, we, honestly, that we really look into mirrors, uh, because we want to see an accurate representation of, of what is in front of us. Um, now, there are a couple things that could prevent a mirror from, from uh, accurately showing or portraying, reflecting uh, what's in front of it, right? Uh, so a mirror could be dirty or, or it could be foggy, right? Uh, and so then uh, you, you cannot clearly see uh, what is being reflected. So, so, imagine, so think about when you step out of the shower. If you, if, you, if you take hot showers, you come out and the mirror's all foggy. 
um, and then you can't really see it. Um, a couple a couple months ago, I, I was uh, going to an event, and um, I was in a rush, and I didn't have time to let my mirror um, defog or, or, or mist, and so. Um, so I, I'm obviously, I, I have a beard. I've had a beard for several years now. Um, I've, I've been told it's a good thing. My face naked is not a good thing. Uh, and so I was, sh I was shaving my beard. I was trying to shape it up. Um, and, but I was in a rush, and I couldn't really see. And so I'm shaving, and then I went off. And then I got stuck in 635 traffic. And while I was there, realized that I had missed a giant patch of hair uh, on the other side of my skin. And so I have everything else shaved, and then I have like a bunch of hair right here. Um, n nothing uh, symmetric, and, and reality is because I couldn't see myself, right? I was like, I, I can kind of see, I'm not sure, um, and, and so in that moment, I couldn't accurately see what I looked like, right? Um, a mirror will also will not reflect uh, uh, what's in front of it if um, it's tilted or if it's skewed or, um, or, or even if it's distorted in some way. Uh, right, and so so we've probably seen um, the the clown mirrors um, at like fun houses if you've been to a, sta uh, a fair or a carnival, um, and, and what it does is you stand in front of it and it's tilted or it's distorted in a certain way so that um, what you see uh, your your the reflection is 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 distorted, right? And so if you're a short guy like me, it can make you look taller or it can make you look shorter, it can make you look fatter or skinnier, um, it can make you look like a, a really small body and a large head. Um, or vice versa, um, and if you already have a really small body and large head, it accentuates it even more, right? Um, and so w w we look at it and, and we, we kind of have fun with it because we know that that's not reality, that, that, that that's not what we really look like, but we could get to have fun with it, right? Um, no one goes out um, and purchases one to put in their bathroom mirror to, to, for when they get ready, right? Like the like girls don't use that when they put makeup on because then, be, then you really look like a clown, right? Um, that's not the, the purpose of it. And then finally, um, a mirror can, um, uh, if, if it's broken or if it's, if it's shattered or if it's cracked, uh, it will not accurately portray um, what's, what's in front of it. Uh, and so the, the, the image here um, is the connotation of a representation, of, of, of a reflection uh, of, so, so we as image bearers of God are to reflect God, to accurately reflect God upon the created order. Um, now, when we read the creation narrative, um, if, if you just just a couple verses before what we just read right now, um, Moses describes how God creates everything. All right, um, and then he gets into the animals, and he 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 begins to use this poetic language, and he starts saying um, that over and over and over. He says God created each animal. So so God creates the the sea creatures and the birds of the air and the animals and the livestock and things that crawl on the ground. And he describes it a certain way. He describes them. He creates them male and female. And then he says after their own kind. Um, male and female after their, their own kind. And what Moses is telling us is, God, is that God is creating animals that are similar to one another um, and, and in a specific way. Um, now, uh, male and female. Now, most of us have uh, taken at least one biology course, um, or if you're like me, you've taken about 10 to 15. Um, and so, any basic uh, understanding of biology tells us um, that um, for two creatures to um, reproduce, they've got to be on the same tree, uh, it's, it's, it's on, on the same uh, tree on, on the animal, right? So, if you remember, King Philip ate good soup. Uh, the, the breakdown in biology, right? Like, you've got to be at least in the same family in order to produce it. So that an elephant and a giraffe cannot mate and produce an elephiraffe, right? Uh, like, like, like that, that doesn't happen. Um, a, a dog and a cat cannot get together and, and form some canine-slash-feline hybrid. It doesn't happen. It, it, God created us in a way where that's not possible. Um, and however, um, we do know that like two lions can get together um, and, 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 and produce a, a lion cub uh, because that's how they were created, after their own kind. Now, when you're reading the, the, the narrative, you would expect um, that the, the, the text would read, um, because it's been saying over and over and over and over and over again that God created them after their own kind, you would expect the text to read, um, and then God created uh, man, male and female, after their own kind. But it doesn't, because in the writing of the text, the author of Genesis pauses 
um, and, and, and he says God pauses, and, and God gets together um, uh, w- w- with the Trinity um, in, in, in a, a holy huddle. He has a conversation with himself, and that's kind of strange, and we'll get to that in a second, right? But God kind of has a conversation with himself, and he's like, you know what? Let's create man, but let's make him in our image. Um, and so God creates man in his image, male and female. And in phrasing it this way, what the, what the writer wants us to, to realize um, is that we share a deep connection with God. Um, that, that, that we're not just any other creatures, right? We're not just any other creatures in, in the animal kingdom, um, but we're created by God to have a relationship with him, to know him intimately. All the other creatures, um, all the other animals were created after their own kind. God creates humans after his, his own kind, uh, his own image. Um, so from the beginning, way back from the beginning, um, God has created us for a relationship with himself, uh, to know him at the deepest level of our being. Um, we're just created that way, right? And so now we know that we're created to be in a relationship with God, and that the idea of image means that we're to reflect God upon uh, the whole created uh, order to, to the world. Um, but to what purpose? Um, uh, so, 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 so what purpose? Um, in order to, to get that, we have to understand um, the context. Now, in, in, in the old days, in, in the ancient times, in ancient civilizations and kingdoms, um, what kings would do is they would set up images of themselves throughout their kingdom uh, to, to say, uh, to, to let everyone know, this is my kingdom, this is my dominion, you are in my land, I'm in charge, this is what I've done. Um, and so archaeologists have dug up um, all these statues and these stelas and these monuments uh, where, um, like, places like Egypt or Babylon, where, where the king uh, will be like, I am king such and such, this is what I've done, um, this is who I've conquered, this is what I'm like, you are in my land to remind his citizens and also to remind foreigners who's in charge and what they're like, right? Um, and, and the kings were declaring the extent of their dominion. Um, and so many scholars believe that what God is trying to convey this message um, is to humanity is that we're created to know God um, uh, and thus reflect his image. His intention for hum- humans are to reflect who, who God is and what he's like to the created order. Um, to reflect his glory, to actually represent him to the world. Um, we are to proclaim uh, in our living that God is the creator and the ruler of, of the universe. And that's our purpose. And so part of this uh, reflection is shown in the commands that God gives uh, Adam and Eve. Um, and so in verse uh, 28, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And so this is how we reflect God um, as his image bearers, right? In the, in the proclamation, we see that the function um, of the mission and, 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 or the mission of mankind in reflecting God is, is what it's supposed to be. Um, it's, it's a threefold function. It's relational, it's cultural, and it's uh, managerial or, or, or stewardship. Um, we're to have relationships with, with one another uh, because God commanded it and because we are to reflect God. Um, now, I, I mentioned back in verse 26, um, uh, about God getting together uh, with himself in the Trinity, right? Um, we as Christians, we understand this idea that God is triune, right? So that God is three, but God is one. And, and, we, and, and it's, it's complicated because we have no examples of, like that, uh, of, of that in nature, right? Um, and so if you, if you begin to think about it long and hard, um, that God is three, I mean, yet somehow God is one, uh, but, it's, but he's three distinct persons, but at the same time, he's, God, he's one God, and we're not to worship any other gods except this one God, but he's yet three. You begin to think about it long and hard, and you begin to experience um, what we call um, spontaneous combustion of the brain, right? It just, like, like, you try to wrap your mind around, like, like, no one's been able to wrap their minds around that, right? Um, but we know that it's true. Um, in fact, like, he says, let us make man in our, in, that, that's plural language, uh, right? Um, God is speaking to himself. Um, and so we know uh, that God is in community with himself. God abides in community. And so we have relationships because God has community within himself. We're supposed to hang out uh, and live life together and do things with other people uh, because that's who God has created us to be. Um, it's why we enjoy things like, like uh, being with people and, and hanging out with people, right? Or singing with people is why we enjoy um, uh, doing life or, or playing sports together or just just sitting across from someone and having a conversation is because that's who we're made and created uh, to be. God is not a God of deception. God is not a God of rebellion. God is not a God of, diso- uh, of, of disobedience. And so because of that, now the image has been tainted. Um, sin and rebellion 
um, and, and brokenness just kind of creep throughout the, um, the throughout humani- humanity and just messes with everything. Um, now, it's not that we don't retain the image of God anymore. We do, but it's like that foggy mirror. It's like the, the broken mirror. Now, what it is is uh, we don't accurately represent who God is, um, who God the King is. And this inaccurate image of God comes out in, in the brokenness of the world, uh, right? So, so violence and, and abuse and rape and racism and murder and molestation and greed and pride and bigotry are, are all ways in which sin has ruined the image of God, um, the imago Dei. So instead of being in loving relationships with one another, we harm one another, both physically and verbally uh, and, and emotionally. Um, in fact, right after Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden, right, like, like the very next sin that's recorded is their kids, right? It, it's their kids. Their son, Cain, murders his brother Abel, right? So all the, now you see one image of God destroying uh, another image of God, it, it, it destroys everything. Brokenness and sin run, run rampant. And we see this today because we experience all the brokenness and sin even in, in today's time. Things like violence and, and war, um, even things like, like guys cheating on girls and girls cheating on guys and things like divorce. Um, it's a product of the image of God being uh, distorted and being broken, the fidelity and faithfulness of God um, being skewed. Things like sexual abuse and, and human trafficking and, 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 and violence and, um, uh, and bigotry and racism and slavery are all effects of humans not accurately representing the image of God uh, to the created order. Um, and, and do you know why we get indignant at things like injustice um, or, or, or why infidelity hurts, why violence causes sorrow? Um, it's because deep at our deepest level, our souls recognize and know that this is not how we were created. This is not what's right. This is not how we're supposed to live. Our souls want to cry out, this is not right. This is not how it's supposed to be. Uh, We're to care for one another in love and another in peace and unity and joy because that's how God created us um, to be. Um, That's what we're supposed to display to the world. Um, But rather the image we often portray, the image we often see and run across is one of depravity and loneliness and hurt. And this is the image that we tend to project to creation, right, an inaccurate representation of God. We live in a fallen world with a fallen race of damaged image bearers. We have fractured relationships. We have corrupted cultures. uh, We have power-craving people who exploit for profit and abuse power. And we're all guilty of it. We've all sinned. And the whole Bible, if you read it, is filled with instance after instance after instance where people use and abuse one another. It's, 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 it's depressing. You read the Old Testament. It's just rampant with, with the sin. And if that was the end of the story, it would be a very depressing story indeed. Um, but we know it's not. We live on the other side of history. And, and we know that about 2,000 years ago, uh, God, uh, the Son, stepped into humanity in the form of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and the Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians that he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Um, right? And so... He um, accurately and and, and faithfully portrays who God is. He lived a blameless, sinless life, and he accurately um, showed us who God the Father truly is. And we know that he was crucified and and that he died, but that he rose again. And it's the reason why thousands of years later, we still meet together to celebrate this fact. Um, But the resurrection of Jesus isn't just some cool or neat story or just some neat miracle. Um, Because Paul tells us in Colossians that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, um, that something happens to us as people, right? Something happens to those who put their faith, who put their trust in Jesus. Um, uh, Colossians chapter 1, 1, verse 21 and 22 reads, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Jesus, the perfect image of God, has reconciled us broken images so that we're able to display more accurately the proper image of God in us. Now, we, use these powerful, we use these powerful words and we don't even uh, sometimes know what, what we're saying. We, we say things like God has reconciled us and he's restored us, redeemed us, renewed us. Um, and the fact is in Jesus, the broken image of God is restored to its original state. Um, and, 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 and do you understand what this means? It means that for the very first time since way back in Genesis chapter 3, we can accurately reflect 
who Jesus is to the world. We can finally do what God has created us to do. We can dwell with one another in unity and in harmony and love, working within culture, stewarding and taking care of our resources. And we do this in such a way that reflects the redeeming creator uh, of the universe. But our reconciliation with God doesn't, doesn't just terminate in, in, uh, in, in, in ourselves. Like the story doesn't end within ourselves. Um, because Jesus, joined, uh, Jesus invites us to join him in his mission, uh, in the mission of God in restoring and renewing the Imago Dei in man. Um, in Matthew chapter 28, we have some of the very uh, last recorded words of Jesus before he's taken up into heaven. Um, and and, and he, gives, um, he gives us a command. We call it the great commission. Um, and it's the mission that, God, that Jesus gives to all of his followers. So you've probably heard this before, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. It reads, um, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And, and we see right here that we are to go and to be, to be Jesus uh, to the world. We are to teach what he taught, to baptize um, in the Trinity, uh, and, and to proclaim the good news to the world. And in this, we join the mission of God in reconciling people to himself. Um, we're called to join God in restoring the image of God in mankind. Uh, we are now God's ambassadors. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians calls us ministers of reconciliation. We are restoring the Imago Dei in broken mirrors. And Jesus promises to be with us, uh, to be with us every step of the way. We get to be participants in a divine cosmic rescue mission. Now, historically, we have used these verses um, to, to uh, encourage people to do overseas missions. Uh, right? Uh, and so uh, we will say, God told us to make disciples of all nations, so, so let's go to all the nations. Um, and this is certainly true, and it's needed because, um, because the God tells us to. Um, and, and just the very fact that many of the apostles actually left and went abroad, went to different nations um, to proclaim the gospel, giving up their lives, is, is certainly an indicator, um, an indicator um, that, um, that that's what Christians uh, even the 21st century, are called to do. Um, b- but this reading would cause us to think, right, if, if we just read it this way, it would make us think that um, this Great Commission is only for a select few people, right? Um, it's only for those who have the ability or the resources or the finances to actually go to the nations um, and, and to, to live out the Great Commission. Uh, but we know that this isn't the case. We know that this is the call upon all Christians' lives. Um, and so in Greek, the, the reading is, um, it's, it's as you go, um, make disciples, right? It implies that you make disciples and live the commission out as you live life, as you go about your daily business, as you go to school, as you go to work, as you interact with your neighbors, as you go to the gym. Um, this, and, and this becomes evidently clear, right? This becomes so clear when we actually read the book of Acts. Um, like if you've ever read the book of Acts, it will blow your mind um, because in chapter 1, you start off, and you have, you have 120 followers of Jesus, right? And a chapter later, you have 3,000 followers of Jesus. And you keep reading it, and you see how, the, how uh, Christianity just explodes. Um, and, and it's not because, uh, uh, not just solely because certain evangelists, uh, evangelists are going out um, to, to different nations. But you see that Christians are, are interacting with, with one another. Um, that in their lives, they're living transformed, renewed lives. Um, it, it, everyone doesn't drop what they're doing and, and, and go o- abroad, right? And so, so the fisherman um, continues to be a fisherman, but now he is a transformed fisherman who, who lives and who lives a different life, who proclaims and displays God in his life and who proclaims it with his life and with his words. Um, and you keep reading, you see that each city, the believers continue to live their lives. Um, and they're rest- they live as restored image bearers in their context preaching the gospel just to everyone that they're around. And, and this is the same call that's given to us 2,000 years later. Um, and, and in fact, we have an even added benefit um, for those of us who live here in Dallas in the 21st century. Um, because I, I, I don't even know if you get this, but we don't even have to ever step on an airplane to reach the nations, uh, right? Like God has actually brought the nations to us. Uh, like in our neighborhoods, in our, our work, uh, in, in our schools, in our, uh, in, 
it's the Starbucks we go to, just uh, the elevators that we're at. God has literally brought people from every continent, or from all the countries, um, to, to uh, interact with us on an almost daily basis. Um, now, Scripture tells us in Acts 17 that, that, is, that God has providentially plotted out, like, where we live um, and in what time we live. So, so that the people you run across are, are, are not ac- by accident. Right? Like, like the neighbors that you live next to are not by accident. Like my parents um, didn't move from India on accident. That I wasn't born in New York and then moved to Dallas when I was eight on accident. That God has providentially um, guided that um, and placed me here in this context for a specific purpose. Um, you are not here this morning by accident or by chance or because you decided, hey, so this morning I'm going to attend Loft. Um, that, that God has said that you're going to live here. Uh, in this period of time, for a specific purpose. Um, it's not by accident or chance. Um, Charles Spurgeon once famously said that every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Um, you're either an, a missionary or you're an imposter. And, and the idea is there's no third option. As you go about, as you live life, um, if you have been saved by God, if you've been restored by grace, then your call and mission is to reach out and reconcile others with the reconciliation that you yourself have received. We're called to be missionaries in our own culture, like in the cultures that we live in, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our neighborhoods. And this is what it means to be missional, to work within our social and relational networks, and by taking it upon ourselves to actually love our neighbors. Um, Every Christian is called to be salt and light um, in wherever they are, in whatever context, and with everyone that they (coughs) happen to meet. We're to reflect the image of God to others and actively protect who God is as one who's in the business of fixing the broken and displaying beauty. And this means that we live intentionally. Um, th- th- this means that, 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 that we live with a purpose. We live seeking ways to share the gospel. Um, and this, this might mean actually becoming friends with your neighbors, uh, right, or, or people you live around and doing things with them. Uh, it means that you uh, might go to the same Starbucks every week in order to cultivate a relationship with the barista that, that you see. Um, it means that, that, that you might grab dinner or, 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 or lunch with, with that new employee. It means that you get out of your comfort zone and develop friends and relationships uh, with the guys that you play basketball with or the guys that you do life with or, or opening up your dorm or your apartment uh, to other students so that they can study um, and living in such an intentional way to display um, the gospel in your life and to proclaim it uh, both in your life and through your words. Being missional means that you are intentional with the resources God has placed around you. And finally, being missional has been called, um, has also been called being incarnational. Um, and that's because we have the perfect image of what it looks like to be missional in the Gospels. Um, see, Jesus um, could have stayed in heaven, could have stayed, because he had community with the, with the Trinity. He could have stayed in his comfort zone um, and just kind of left us to be broken uh, images of God down here on earth. Um, he didn't have to get into the fight. Um, however, he stepped into time. Um, and stepped into skin, and he poured it out for others. And he taught us, he taught, and he healed, and he forgave, and he prayed, and he did miracles, and he mourned with those around him, and he was intentional with the lives of the disciples that, um, that, 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 that he ministered to, that he lived with, um, that he did life with. And he lived with such a rigorous purpose to bring glory to the Father. He did it to, point, um, uh, he did it to the point where it cost him his very life. Missional ministry means uh, being Jesus, living incarnationally within the cultures and and settings that God has placed us in. And and as we do this, uh, as we live as Jesus commanded us, um, as God intended for us to way back in Genesis chapter 1, we see that the mission of God is to restore the image of God in order that we may once again be in a perfect relationship by which we bring and reflect the glory of God to the created uh, order, always pointing to God. We see that the mission of God is to restore the image of God in order that we may once again, in perfect uh, relationship, uh, by which we bring and reflect the glory of God in the created order. Always pointing to God. We join the mission of God as his image bearers. Uh, This morning, if you are in Christ, if you you profess Christ, if you follow Christ, that is the calling on your life. You have no other option. Every Christian is called to be a missionary. Um, God has placed you at your universities um, in uh, your, your neighborhoods for a specific purpose uh, to live out the gospel. 
to live with intention, to live in community, to accurately portray to those around you that this is who God is. This is what he's like. He's holy and he's just and he's righteous. We live, this is what he's done in me. And this is what he can done in you. If, if, you, if you don't follow Christ this morning, this is what he offers. This is what he offers. He offers to transform you, to fix the brokenness, to fix the broken image so that now you can be, you can accurately live the image of God. This morning we also get to uh, celebrate this um, uh, as we take communion. Um, and this morning we actually show, uh, it, in communion we actually represent what Christ has done. Right? Like, like this, this is what, like when we celebrate communion, we celebrate that in Christ, in the breaking of his body and in the shedding of his blood, he has reconciled us and all creation to himself, back to God. Um, and, and, and so because of that, now we, we can live uh, as we were created to live. Um, this is what we celebrate this morning. Um, and so as the band uh, sings a song, um, let's just pray. Um, reflecting upon who we are, that if we are in Christ, how we are to live, who we are, and how we are to live um, as, as, as God's ambassadors um, in our cultures, uh, in our neighborhoods. Um, bow your heads with me. Father, um, we thank you for what you've done, Lord, and who you are. Father, for sending Jesus, Lord God, when, when, when we couldn't do it, Lord God, when we had sinned, when we had uh, distorted, when we were, when we were projecting um, broken representations of what you are like, that's all of creation, Lord. Uh, you sent Jesus, Lord, to, to rescue us, to restore what we could not restore um, on our own. Holy Spirit, would you remind us, Lord, that all of us are called to live on mission. Lord God, that, that that was your purpose way back in Genesis chapter 1, to reflect to the world who you are. And now, as restored image bearers, that that is still our purpose. Lord God, I pray, Lord, that we would recognize, Lord, that you have providentially placed us within our circles of friends, within our communities. God, that we would live with unction. Lord God, that we would live with purpose, with in intentionality, Lord. Lord God, that we would have intentional conversations, Lord God. That we would intentionally meet up with people. That we would intentionally pour out our lives, Lord God. Because, Lord, that is what you have done for us. Holy Spirit, would you transform our hearts, soften our hearts so that we live in such a way. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for doing what we couldn't do, Lord, and restoring that. We celebrate Jesus. I pray that this truth, Lord God, uh, would just settle upon our hearts, press upon our hearts.